Rain or shine, the summer wouldn't be complete without breathtaking air shows to entertain families and aviation enthusiasts alike. Air shows span the history of aviation, often with a good range of military aircraft on display, so spectators can be watching the latest frontline fighter, the Typhoon, one minute, and an illustrious warbird such as a hurricane or Spitfire the next. Public displays are an excellent opportunity for the military to proudly show off the next generation of aircraft, with pilots often performing unimaginably jaw-dropping maneuvers. A regular on the display circuit since the Eurofighter's first British airshow appearance at Farnborough in 1996, this British, German and Italian fighter is one of the world's most advanced aircraft. Named the Typhoon after its famous World War II predecessor, which excelled at air-to-ground combat, the new Typhoon is much the same, capable of lethal attacks on enemy targets, as well as being prepared for air-to-air -air combat against enemy planes. The frontline aircraft are single-seaters, but the trainers, such as this one, have two seats. The RAF Typhoon gives the British an edge over virtually any competitor, and is at least equal to anything produced by the Americans. Besides the RAF and the German Air Force, the Typhoon is now flown by the Austrian, Italian, Spanish and Saudi Arabian Air Forces. The RAF currently has 49 Typhoons in service, with more on order, and 683 Typhoons ultimately expected to be built. The Typhoon's capabilities are striking, but so is the expense. Development required £17 billion, and each aircraft produced costs around £30 million. Still, the cost is worth it. The Typhoon flies like a dream. The design allows the aircraft superb maneuverability at both low and supersonic speeds. The Typhoon uses very sophisticated computer-driven fly-by-wire controls that keep the pilots from making errors. Still, it's the man of the controls who must ultimately make the final decisions. One of the most interesting features is the Typhoon's automatic voice control system. This allows the pilot to literally tell the aircraft what to do. They can ask the jet to move right or left, or up or down. The Typhoon entered service with the German Air Force in 2003, finally becoming a line aircraft for the RAF in March 2007.
The two engines can push the Typhoon to a top speed of 1,550 miles per hour and up to a ceiling of 65,000 feet. But it can just as easily operate at slower speeds, very close to the ground. The Typhoon's armament is formidable, carrying air-to-air -air missiles along with air-to-ground missiles and regular bombs. Like its predecessors going back to the First World War, the Typhoon carries a gun in case all else fails. From the breathtaking Typhoon, we move on to some more sedate, former airliners now put to work by the RAF. The old but venerable Vickers VC-10 and Lockheed TriStar serve primarily as aerial refueling tankers for the RAF. The VC-10 came into use by the RAF in the early 1970s and the TriStar in the early 1980s. There are only 14 VC-10s still in service with the RAF and 8 TriStars. Both will soon be replaced by a new Airbus tanker. Still, for the moment, these two reliable aircraft keep the RAF in the sky. They may look like lumbering jets, but to a pilot short on fuel, these refuelers are a welcome sight.
One thirsty customer for their services is the Harrier. The RAF Harrier is perhaps the most rugged and versatile aircraft serving with both the RAF and the Royal Navy. The first Harrier was built in the 1960s by Hawker Sidley and entered service in April 1969. The Harrier's ability to take off, land and hover like a helicopter gives it extraordinary capabilities. It's the only jet fighter that doesn't need a runway to operate from. The variable thrust vector nozzles of the engine give the Harrier this unusual ability. But it also means the pilot has to learn a totally new way to fly compared to flying a conventional jet. The early Harriers only entered major combat once during the Falklands War of 1982 when they destroyed 21 Argentinian aircraft with a loss of four Harriers. BAE Systems took over manufacture from Hawker Sidley and a second generation Harrier, the BAE Harrier II, was designed in the late 1970s and soon entered service. Introduced as the GR5, it was soon updated to the GR7. And now the very advanced GR9 is in service. The Harrier II differs from its predecessors in many ways. The aluminium alloy fuselage was replaced with one made from composites, which have lowered the weight of the Harrier and increased its payload capability. It also has a head-up display, which enables both day and night capabilities. Generally, the Harrier II is a stronger and more aggressive fighter. The Harrier GR-7 formed the spearhead of the RAF's contribution to Operation Allied Force, the NATO mission in Kosovo. During this campaign, the RAF identified significant shortcomings in its arsenal. As a result, the service ordered the AGM-65 Maverick standoff missile and the enhanced paved way, which incorporates GPS guidance to negate the effects of smoke and bad weather. Using updated ordnance, as well as unguided iron and cluster munitions, RAF Harrier GR-7s 
played a prominent role in Operation Telic, the UK contribution to the US-led war against Iraq in 2003. RAF GR-7s participated in strike and close air support missions throughout the conflict. Harrier GR-7s were deployed in Afghanistan as part of the NATO mission in the south of Afghanistan. On the 14th of October 2005, an RAF Harrier GR-7A was destroyed and another was damaged in a rocket attack by Taliban forces while parked on the tarmac at Kandahar. No one was injured in the attack. The damaged Harrier was repaired whilst the destroyed one was replaced by another aircraft. Reflecting the increased pace of operations, RAF Harrier GR-7As saw a large increase in munitions used. The Harriers used mainly CRV-7 rockets and laser-guided bombs for supporting ground forces since July 2006. The first operational deployment of the latest version, the Harrier GR-9, was in January 2007 at Kandahar in Afghanistan as part of the NATO International Security Assistance Force. The GR-9 in Afghanistan has been much appreciated by the troops that the Harrier has been supporting in combat. Its rockets and laser-guided bombs have proven to be extremely effective and lethal. The Harrier II can fly at 662 miles per hour and has a combat radius of 300 miles. Following the withdrawal of the Royal Navy's Sea Harriers in 2006, the RAF's Harrier fleet is now tasked with the missions that it used to share with the Navy. In 2006, the GR-9 also entered service with the Fleet Air Arm, when the first former Sea Harrier squadron reformed. The GR-9 is expected to stay in service until at least 2015, when the first F-35s are due. At this point, the Joint Strike Fighter should be gaining operational capability. 
Since 1969, 824 Harrier variants have been delivered to the British military. Next to fly is perhaps one of the most important but often forgotten aircraft of World War II, the consolidated aircraft PBY Catalina. Chris Noon, a former commercial pilot, demonstrates both the grace and elegance of the Catalina in this wonderful display. Built originally in the 1930s, this flying boat served with both the American and British Air Forces, as well as in Australian and Canadian forces. The Catalina excelled in the anti-submarine warfare role. Initially built for the Americans, the Catalina was well suited for the air war in the Pacific, since it had a range of more than 2,000 miles. Perhaps the Catalina's greatest moment was its role in spotting the Japanese naval fleet approaching Midway Island. That gave the Americans just enough warning to be able to stop the Japanese and allow American aircraft to virtually destroy the enemy force. This was the turning point in the Pacific War. Serving with Britain's Coastal Command, it was a Catalina that spotted the German battleship Bismarck as it tried to avoid the Royal Navy. This sighting led to the sinking of the Bismarck. The Catalina, which is amphibious, was crucial in rescuing sailors at sea during the Second World War. After the war, the Catalina continued in military service for many years. More than 4,000 were built, at a unit cost of only £53,000 each. Today there are a few dozen still flying, most of which are used as aerial water bombers for firefighting. Their link to the past should not be forgotten. From the classic style of the Catalina, we move on to what's become the RAF's iconic jet trainer, the BAE Hawk. The Hawk was first flown in 1974 and entered RAF service in 1976. A very solid and reliable aircraft, the single-engined Hawk is used primarily as a trainer aircraft, but is capable of serving in combat if necessary. The aircraft can fly nearly at the speed of sound and has a range of 1,565 miles. It can be armed with a 30mm Aden cannon 
and up to 6,800 pounds of missiles and bombs. The world's most successful advanced jet trainer, more than 900 Hawks have been sold worldwide, serving various roles in 18 Air Forces. The Hawk is perhaps most famous for its service with the RAF's Red Arrows Aerobatic Display Team. But the main task of the RAF Hawk still remains teaching young pilots how to handle a fast jet aircraft. The RAF pilots who learn to fly in the Hawk then move ahead to more sophisticated aircraft but no doubt keep a place in their heart for the trainer that literally launched their flying careers. From the best-selling advanced jet trainer to one of the world's most popular multi-role fighter aircraft, the Lockheed Martin F-16 Fighting Falcon. The F-16 Fighting Falcon has earned its wings both in the Cold War and more recently when the F-16 has been in combat in Iraq and in the skies over Afghanistan. Developed by General Dynamics, the F-16 Fighting Falcon is one of the most significant fighters of the latter part of the 20th century. It was originally developed from a concept for an experimental lightweight fighter and has evolved into an all-weather fighter and precision attack aircraft. The F-16 has been manufactured on as many as five separate production lines, making it the largest fighter program in the Western world. Over 2,200 F-16s are in service with the USAF. Another 2,000 are operational in other countries with production still continuing. As early as 1965, the US Air Force had begun concept formulation studies of new high-performance fighters. These included the FX, a heavy interceptor air superiority fighter and the lightweight advanced day fighter, or ADF. The appearance of the Mach 2.8 capable MiG-25 Foxbat in 1967 frightened US Defense Department analysts and prompted a redirection for US fighter development, with high performance once again becoming the primary concern. The FX concept was eventually to emerge as the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, a twin-engine fighter with advanced avionics and long-range missiles. 
Ultimately, the General Dynamics company would develop and build a prototype ADF. It would be the F-16. The F-16 was designed to be a cost-effective combat workhorse that can perform various kinds of missions and maintain around-the-clock readiness. It's much smaller and lighter than its predecessors, but uses advanced aerodynamics and avionics. Entering service in 1979, this aircraft with a 10-meter wingspan has nine hardpoints for weapons payloads, one at each wingtip, three under each wing, and one centerline under the fuselage. The air-conditioned and pressurized cockpit is fitted with an ACES 2.0 ejection seat in case of emergency. The pilot's view from the cockpit of the F-16 is unmatched by just about any other fighter aircraft. The pilot sits underneath a frameless bubble canopy whose forward and center sections are made of a single piece of polycarbonate. With no canopy supports, the pilot has an unrestricted view in all directions. It makes a successful lock-on for his missiles much easier. Visibility from the cockpit covers a full 360 degrees in the horizontal and from 15 degrees down over the nose through the vertical and back to directly behind. With a side-mounted control stick to ease operation under high G-forces, the aircraft's control system is fly-by-wire with computers making constant adjustments to the trim leaving the pilot free to concentrate on flying and maneuvering in a dogfight, so expertly demonstrated here. The head-up display, or HUD, is designed to allow the pilot to keep his opponent in view at all times while checking out his instrumentation. When he has a positive lock, he hear a loud beeping in his helmet headphones, and a light will flash on the head-up display. The port wing is fitted with a 20mm M61A1 multi-barrel cannon with the gun sight interface to the cockpit head-up display. The space normally reserved for the internally mounted M61 Vulcan cannon is taken up by an oil tank which is used to produce the smoke during air show demonstrations. In March of 1982, it was announced that the US Air Force's Thunderbirds flight demonstration team would trade in its T-38 Talons for F-16 Fighting Falcons, with the first public demonstration being flown in April of 1983. Highly nimble, the F-16 can pull 9G maneuvers and can reach a maximum speed of over 1500 miles an hour, or Mach 2. F-16 Falcons perform incredible maneuvers during air shows, placing huge physical and mental demands on the pilots. An air display takes immense concentration. It's said that the pilots expand a full day's mental energy in the space of one hour during the show. The pilots and their maintenance crews have a strong attachment to their individual aircraft. The crews feel especially proprietary. The planes are theirs, and they just occasionally lend them to the pilots. It's a fiction the pilots are happy to go along with, because no one appreciates the maintenance crew more than the pilot. In the beginning, some thought had been given to naming the F-16 the Mustang II, even though the original Mustang was a North American aviation product. The name Condor was also considered. 
On July the 21st, 1980, the Air Force announced that the official name of the F-16 would be Fighting Falcon, which was the mascot of the United States Air Force Academy. The prefix was considered necessary in order to avoid litigation by Dassault, which markets an executive jet with the name Falcon, as well as to avoid confusion with the Hughes Falcon air-to-air -air missile. Pilots and ground crews almost never use the full name, usually referring to the F-16 simply as Falcon. The unofficial name Viper is quite often used for the F-16 by pilots due to the aircraft's resemblance to a Cobra snake, also known as the electric jet, a reference to the fly-by-wire flight control system. The F-16 is due to remain in service with the US Air Force until 2025, with its replacement, the F-35 Lightning II, due to enter service from 2011. One of the predecessors to the F-16 is the Lockheed F-80 Shooting Star, seen here on display with the F-86 Sabre. The F-80 Shooting Star, along with its sister aircraft, the North American Aviation F-86, were the heroes of the United States Air Force in the Korean War. Developed in 1943 during the Second World War by the early Skunk Works team, the Shooting Star entered service in late 1944. The F-80 was noted for achieving a number of firsts. It was the first USAF aircraft to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight, the first American jet produced in large quantities, and the first jet to be used in combat. The F-80 was also involved in the first jet versus jet air battle with a MiG-15 on the 8th of November 1950, but the more expensive F-86 Sabre jet soon took its place. The first production F-86 model was initially designated the P-86A, but became the F-86A in June 1948. And by the time the new fighter entered US Air Force service in 1949, it had gained the name Sabre. The F-86 and the F-80 proved to the world that the Americans would not and could not be beaten in the air. From classic fighters of the Cold War era, this next aircraft is the state-of-the-art medium-sized C-27J Spartan military transporter. In production since 2001, the Alenia C-27J Spartan, designated the C-27A Spartan in the US, is based upon the company's earlier G-222 airframe, but with the engines and systems of the Lockheed Martin C-130J Super Hercules. In 1995, Alenia and Lockheed Martin began discussions to improve the Alenia's G222 aircraft using the Super Hercules' glass cockpit with a more powerful version of the G222's T64G engine and four-blade propellers. Alenia and Lockheed Martin formed Lockheed Martin Alenia Tactical Support Systems for the joint development in 1997. However, this joint venture later dissolved when Lockheed Martin offered the Super Hercules as a contender in the same U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force joint cargo aircraft competition in which the C-27J planned to compete. Today, L3 Communications Integrated is the prime contractor and is teamed with Alenia North America, Boeing Integrated Defense Systems and Global Military Aircraft Systems, a joint venture of L3 and Alenia, to market the C-27J. The team entered the C-27J in the joint cargo aircraft competition against Lockheed Martin, Raytheon and EADS North America's C-295. The C-27J won, being awarded a contract worth just over 2 billion US dollars on the 13th of June 2007 for 78 C-27Js, comprising of 54 aircraft for the US Army and 24 for the US Air Force, along with training and support. Powered by two Rolls-Royce Defense North America turboprop engines, the C-27J has a 35% increase in range and a 30% higher cruise ceiling in comparison to the G-222, 
with a maximum speed of 362 miles per hour and a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. This rugged aircraft boasts the highest power to weight ratio in its class and the ability to perform 3G maneuvers in the style of fighter aircraft, enabling tight turns and a rapid climb and descent. The C-27J can fly further, faster and higher than any other twin-engine military transport aircraft in its class. The primary roles of the C-27J are cargo transport, troop transport and paratroop airdrop. The C-27J is versatile. It can cope with most military medium transport needs ranging from carrying 68 troops to one helicopter to two Humvees or three howitzer guns. Other missions include humanitarian airdrops, maritime patrol, tactical operations, medical evacuation, ground refueling, firefighting and aerial spraying. The C-27J features the unique capability to vary the cargo floor height and other adjustments ensuring easy loading and unloading of large volume payloads without ground support equipment. Military vehicles can be driven on and off the Spartan via a hydraulically operated rear loading ramp. The aircraft is constructed to offload vehicles quickly while taking fire. The C-27J has other outstanding threat avoidance capabilities, including a takeoff ground run of about 1,900 feet at maximum takeoff weight on an unpaved surface. In a tactical environment, the aircraft is capable of climbing to 10,000 feet in three minutes and descending from 10,000 feet in under two and a half minutes. The two-pilot cockpit is night vision goggle NVG compatible. The flight deck is very similar to that of the C-130J Hercules. The electronic flight instrumentation system incorporates five liquid crystal head-down color displays. The C-27J is the best-selling twin turboprop military tactical airlifter in the world. Customers include the Italian, Greek, Bulgarian, Lithuanian, Slovakian, Canadian, Moroccan and Romanian Air Forces. The C-27J has already seen service in a hostile environment. The Italian Air Force deployed two C-27Js to Afghanistan from the 12th of September 2008 to the 27th of January 2009 in support of NATO airlift operations. A predecessor of the C-27J Spartan, 
is the World War II Douglas C-47 Dakota, which was the transport workhorse of the RAF, carrying thousands of paratroopers into battles at D-Day and Arnhem. Part of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, this is equipped with authentic period para seats and still used in commemorative parachute drops. For a few harrowing months during the middle and late summer of 1940, the skies over England formed a battleground for an air conflict that would decide the fate of the entire world for decades to come. From July through to September of that year, the hitherto unstoppable Nazi war machine that had overrun all of Europe threw the entire weight of the Luftwaffe against Great Britain. Against this mighty air armada was the Royal Air Force, with a mere 700 fighters and barely enough pilots to fill them. Out of England's darkest hour came its finest, the Battle of Britain. The Spitfire is probably the most emblematic aircraft of that particular conflict, although the older, slower Hurricane, which the RAF at the time had in greater numbers, was actually the unsung workhorse of the campaign and accounted for two-thirds of enemy losses over Britain. 547 RAF airmen died in the conflict along with 1,807 German airmen. Both sides were simply doing their duty. That great moment is remembered by the RAF Historic Aircraft Flight's collection of flyable historic aircraft, but later the scope was broadened to commemorate the RAF's involvement in all the campaigns of World War II and became known as the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight in 1973. Despite the advance of time, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight continues to present their aircraft in the environment where they can be seen at their best, in clear skies, where all can appreciate their beauty and be stirred once again by the music of their engines. This is perhaps the most fitting memorial to the thousands of pilots and crew who gave their lives in order to defend the freedoms we enjoy today. One of the RAF's most recent acquisitions is the medium-lift helicopter, the Augusta Westland AW101, the Merlin HC-3. The Augusta Westland AW101, formerly the EH-101, was developed for military applications, but also marketed for civil use. Italy and the UK agreed to work together on a medium-lift helicopter in 1979, with GKN Westland and Augusta forming a joint venture company, EH Industries, to manage the project. With an initial budget of £20 billion to develop nine pre-production examples, a mock-up of a utility version of the new helicopter was revealed at the 1985 Paris Air Show, leading to a design that could be customised by military and civilian operators. After a lengthy development, the first prototype flew on the 9th of October 1987, with the helicopter manufactured at the Augusta Westland facilities in Yeovil, England and Vergiate, Italy.
Augusta and GKM Westland merged to form Augusta Westland in June 2007. The EH101 was rebranded as the AW101. The name Merlin is used for AW101s in British, Danish and Portuguese military service. The RAF Merlins, Bird of Prey, HC-3 and HC-3A are operated by No. 28 AC Squadron and 78 Squadron at RAF Benson in Oxfordshire. The Merlin is the first of a new generation of advanced medium support helicopters for the RAF and Royal Navy. The all-weather, day and night, multi-role helicopter is used in both tactical and strategic operational roles. Its primary RAF roles are defensive. The Merlin carries a radar and laser warning receiver missile approach warners and directional infrared countermeasures equipment, all integrated with an automatic chaff and flare dispensing system. This is one of the most comprehensive defensive aid suites fitted to any helicopter in the world. The Royal Navy Merlins are used for anti-surface ship and submarine warfare, tracking and surveillance, amphibious operations and search and rescue missions. The RAF ordered 22 transport helicopters designated Merlin HC-3, the first of which entered service with No. 28 Squadron in January 2001. The rotor system, which is fully folding, benefits from some of the most advanced helicopter aerodynamics in the world, giving a maximum speed of 167 knots. The Merlin carries four aircrew and flies at a maximum altitude of 15,000 feet. This display is piloted by Flight Lieutenant Dempster of No. 28 Squadron RAF. The squadron insignia includes the Gurkha's cookery knife, as they were the last unit to leave the former colony of Hong Kong in 1997. The unit was reformed in 2000 to operate the first Merlin HC-3 helicopters from RAF Benson. The first operational deployment by the squadron with its Merlins was in 2003 in Bosnia. They were also deployed to southern Iraq as part of Operation Telic until April 2009 when British forces withdrew from Iraq. Flight Sergeant Ross Brompton coordinates the display manoeuvres from the centre seat, while Sergeant Addy Unsworth operates the cargo ramp. This running landing on the main runway is undertaken at 60 knots, the maximum speed possible for this manoeuvre.
In this amazing display, the Merlin goes from 140 knots to zero knots as it comes to a rapid stop, hovers, and then Flight Lieutenant Dempster performs a maneuver very few can do, flying backwards whilst climbing at the same time. He climbs to 300 feet before bowing to the crowd. With sophisticated navigation systems, the aircraft's management computers take data from a laser gyro platform, a Doppler system and air data sources to combine the information with data received from global positioning system satellites. Navigation at night is enhanced by the crew's use of night vision goggles and by the aircraft's multifunction turret, which can be fitted with forward-looking infrared radar. With the cargo ramp crew acting as the eyes and ears, the helicopter climbs to 600 feet to perform the roller coaster. On the front is the large probe for air-to-air -air refueling. The Merlin is equipped with extended range fuel tanks and is capable of air-to-air -air refueling. However, due to the lack of a suitable UK tanker aircraft, this capability has not been cleared for use. Further range can be achieved by shutting down the third engine during the cruising phase of flight. The helicopter is also fitted with an active vibration damping system which helps to reduce the noise and vibration inside the cabin to a level no greater than that of a turboprop aircraft. The Merlin is able to carry a diverse range of bulky cargo, either internally or under slung. Cargo can include artillery, Land Rovers or light strike vehicles, and over five tons of freight. The spacious cabin can also accommodate up to 24 fully equipped combat troops and, when required, will convert to carry 16 stretchers for casualty evacuation or during humanitarian and disaster relief operations. The Merlin is armed with two general purpose machine guns converted for the air roll, although there is provision for additional weaponry to be fitted at a later date. In February 2005, a version of the Merlin, the US-101, was chosen as the replacement helicopter for the US Marine One Presidential Transport Fleet requirement. Next to fly, the Fuga Magister, nicknamed the Whistling Turtle by the Belgian Air Force. The Fuga Magister is a light two-seater aircraft with pressurized cockpit. The aircraft is perhaps best known for its V-shaped tail, which originated from the CM8, an earlier glider used to experiment with jet engines. The Fuga Magister, company designation CM170, was developed in the early 1950s from a 1949 design by two French designers Robert Castello and Pierre Malboussin. Although the Magister is often lauded as the first purpose-built two-seat turbojet-powered trainer aircraft, similar claims are made for the Fokker S14 Mac trainer, whose first flight, production and service entry were all about a year earlier. However, the Fuga Magister was much more successful, in some ways too successful. Customers were reluctant to upgrade to later models. In December 1950, the French military ordered three prototypes. The butterfly tail Fuga CM-130 Magister prototype first flew in mid-1952. The aircraft entered service with the French Air Force in 1956. Even though the Fuga Magister trainer has a large canopy, the instructor seat has a very bad forward view. To solve this, a periscope was installed. The aircraft could also be equipped to undertake light attack duties. 
It could be fitted with two machine guns in the nose, several combinations of underwing rockets or bombs, and even air-to-surface missiles. Israel proved the Magister's combat value during the Six-Day War in June 1967, when the Magister flew ground attack missions in Egypt and Jordan. The long wings make the Magister very stable and easy to fly. The wings contain the landing gear and air brakes, which deploy above and beneath the wing, but no fuel tanks. The Fuga Magister design did not change much throughout its production life when over 900 units were built. The CM170R1 had Turbo Mika Mabore 2 engines with just 400 kilograms of thrust and was underpowered. This caused problems with aerobatics and on takeoff. Rough turns at high altitude and bad weather could cause the engines to flame out. The later CM172 variant had the stronger Marbore 6 engines. Production of the Magister stopped in France in 1962, but they continued to be built in Finland up to 1967. Display pilot Lieutenant Colonel Paul Keane had been the Fuga display pilot for five years, but after more than 46 years' service with the Belgian Air Force and 249,000 flying hours, this wonderful aircraft retired at the end of 2006. From a red Belgian Air Force icon, we move on to the Royal Air Force Red Icons, the Royal Air Force Aerobatic Display Team, affectionately known as the Red Arrows. The Red Arrows are a British institution, as well as a world-renowned air display team. They've flown over 4,000 displays in 53 countries. The Red Arrows were formed in 1964 to become the first official Pan-RAF aerobatic display team. Initially, they were made up of Folland Nat T1 jet trainers, but moved on to Bork Advanced Trainers in 1979. The first public display was on the 9th of May 1965 at Clermont-Ferrand in France. They're called the Red Arrows due to the training aircraft being predominantly red and the Black Arrows being a popular squadron aerobatic team in the late 1950s and early 60s. Currently based at RAF Scampton, they're a fully operational squadron, so it's not possible to visit them on site. Typically during training, Pilots fly three times a day. With each flight or display, there's a brief and a debrief, plus a lot of planning. The purpose of the Red Arrows is not merely recreational. They serve as a good advert for the RAF and drum up recruitment whenever they display. Members of the squadron will often talk with people who come to watch to explain what they do and how they got there. There are often presentations for schools given by pilots. Every spring since 1980, the Red Arrow Squadron has deployed to Royal Air Force Akrotiri in Cyprus. They use this time as intensive training in the build-up to the summer displays and return in May, if the Commander-in-Chief awards public display authority. To become a pilot in the Red Arrows, the criteria are quite stern. You need to have had a minimum of 1,500 flying hours in the RAF. You also need to have been a fast jet pilot in an aircraft such as a Tornado or a Harrier. As well as this, you must have completed one operational frontline tour. And finally, you have to be classed as an above average flyer. A short list of nine is drawn up, from which three new pilots join the team each year. After intensive training and interviews in Cyprus, the pilots then serve a three-year tour. The Red Arrow's motto is Eclat displayed on their badge. It means brilliance or excellence, and as we can see, they always adhere to this. Another trademark of the Red Arrows is their Diamond 9 formation, as often seen in flypasts and demonstrated here. The Diamond 9 formation came about in mid-1966, as the squadron added two more pilots to its previous total of seven. The team leader at the time, Ray Hanna, was keen to include the Diamond 9 formation in routines. The physical demands of being a Red Arrows pilot are high. The main section of the squadron can experience around 5 Gs regularly, and this can often creep up to 7 and occasionally 8 G. 
to combat this, Red Arrow pilots wear anti-G suits. These suits are attached to hose pipes, which pump pressurized air into tubes in the suit. Whilst performing maneuvers, the suit provides pressurized air proportional to the amount of G. This is centered around the abdomen and legs to help the pilot stop blood rushing away from his brain. If this were to happen, the pilot would more than likely black out. Not advisable in a single pilot aircraft. In March 2009, a report by the Air Safety Board showed how the quick thinking of a Red Arrow squadron leader prevented a catastrophe in the air. Returning from a display at Western Supermare to Bristol Airport in August 2008, the nine Hawk jets narrowly avoided a Boeing 737. Air traffic controllers failed to inform the Red Arrows team that the 737 would be crossing their path and asked them to climb to the same altitude of 2,500 feet. Fortunately, the Red Arrows leader spotted the airliner through thick cloud and told the rest of his team to level off. The jet then passed some 270 meters above the squadron. The Air Safety Board praised the squadron leader, believing that his swift action averted any major crisis. The colored smoke produced by the Red Arrows is for the pilot's own benefit as it shows wind speed and direction more clearly than other means. Being decorative is a large bonus for the crowds assembled to watch. The smoke also helps with safety for the pilots and queuing when a large distance apart. The smoke comes from an additional fuel tank on the underside of the fuselage. The tank is full of diesel fuel, which when released meets the 500 degrees Celsius jet exhaust, instantly vaporizing it, making the white color. Red and blue dyes are added to make the alternate colors. In any one display, each jet carries enough diesel to produce seven minutes worth of smoke. The colored smoke means that display moves such as the champagne split, the jippo break, and the infamous heart are given huge impact when viewed from the ground. The diesel is replaced by a team of three people. They wear special silver suits which protect them if some of the diesel spills out. The dyes are always added in the same order so as not to get them mixed up. Red, then blue. Two of the most experienced pilots in the squadron, always in the third year of their tour, combined to make up the synchro pair. These two perform the most death-defying stunts, flying closer to the ground and experiencing more g-force than the rest of the group. The Red Arrows fly at about 300 feet above the ground. The synchro pair can fly as low as 100 feet. These heights are irrelevant of weather conditions, although cloudy skies can make the aircraft seem lower. The Hawks themselves are single-engine jets, mainly used for training, but on occasion used for low-cost combat. The Hawk entered service with the Royal Air Force in 1976, and since then, over 800 have been delivered. The Hawk is 11.35 meters in length, with a wingspan of 9.94 meters. Empty, the aircraft weighs just 4,450 kilograms. The Hawks have two seats, although the Red Arrows very rarely take passengers, apart from support members. In 2008, a British woman, Julie Heseldon, bid £1.5 million in a Help for Heroes charity auction to be able to fly in a Red Arrow. Julie and eight friends join a small elite able to fly in the passenger seats during a flight. Red 10 is essentially a reserve aircraft, available at all displays in case it's needed. However, it also performs other important functions. Red 10 is piloted by the team's manager 
It's his responsibility to ensure that ground conditions are safe before displays begin. He also coordinates displays and provides the air display commentary for the team. The Red Arrows will not fly until Red 10 has given the green light that the crowds and pilots are operating in a safe environment. He also takes Ministry of Defence sanctioned cameramen and photographers in the reserve plane to film the Red Arrows from the air. This takes a lot of skill, as not only does he have to follow the manoeuvres of the squadron well, he also has to provide a suitable and stable shooting platform from which to take aerial shots. Probably the most important member of the Red Arrows is the team leader. The team leader has to have completed a three-year tour previously with the Red Arrows, so numbers are limited. He must also be of squadron leader rank. When the team leader is offered the job, he has the opportunity to refuse, but none are recorded as doing so. The team leader will have a large say in the makeup of formations and displays and coordinates the aircraft whilst in the air. There's no standby for a team leader, therefore, if the team leader is unfit to fly, the display is abandoned. This has only rarely happened. The Red Arrows have become a large part of British tradition and long may it remain. The profession's highlight is regarded by many to be the fly past alongside Concorde at the Queen's Golden Jubilee in 2002. Let's hope that the splendor and entertainment that the Red Arrows bring is continued into future generations.